Good morning. It's, it's been 23 years since I've last stood on a stage in South Africa, so it's uh, the certain sense of trepidation that, uh, that I stand in front of you this morning. However, you will see that my, my slide uh, today on the, on the cover slide is branded just as Andy Kallitz because uh, I neither speak on behalf of Shell nor do I speak on behalf of Eskom today. But I'd like to share with you some of the, um, the insights that I've gained in the, uh, in, in the past 23 years and the, in the period before that whilst I was with Eskom. Looking back at the previous century, it is clear to me that the, 20, the 20, 20th century was built on the golden era of industrial development on the back of first coal, which transitioned into oil, which transitioned into gas. And that gave us global rail transportation, it gave us th all the smelting industries and the, and the metal industries of the world, it gave us, the gave us the car transportation industry, it gave us the comfort of air conditioning, it gave us international air transport, it gave us uh, the gas turbine, which is either drives a plane or drives a ship or drives a power plant. It gave, the, gave us the International Maritime Organization uh, and an industry which, uh, which transports uh, goods so effectively around the world. And last but not least, uh, coal and oil and gas gave us the, the global power industry. But the agenda globally has, has changed completely. That changed, apologies, is today one in which man-made acceleration of climate change now to a degree which I have to say I do not believe is yet understood in, 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 in South Africa dominates energy policy abroad. It is the first criterion listed about the decisions that need to be taken in boardrooms and it's, it's the first criterion listed as to what is going to have to be dealt with in, in national energy policy and it is at the core of the decision making that, uh, that uh, surrounds energy in the world. It's also clear to me that the energy transition that we speak of sometimes is thought of as something which started in 2010. No, the energy transition in some ways started, if one looks at the build-up and the glo and this is global energy consumption, uh, started a, a century ago as the world first moved from wood to coal, and then from coal to oil, and then from oil to gas and nuclear, and now is, ta is tackling the next phase of that energy transition, which is taking place as renewables enter the global energy discussion. But when I say it is accelerating, it is accelerating at a rate which is absolutely astounding. Now, during the, uh, the past 20 years that I've been away, I've, I've seen the global energy industry from a number of perspectives, and I thought I would simply put a red dot on some of those perspectives because they, they each, uh, I, lived, I lived on all six of the continents now, they, they each somehow deeply ingrained in me some of the, uh, the, the deep lessons. Uh, the, the period on developing Kamasaya and Peru is, is not on here. But let me first go to, to Russia. Russia uh, was the, the author of the uh, strategic alliance between Shell and Gazprom. Uh, Gazprom, the large state, oil, uh, state gas company of, of Russia, uh, lived in Moscow for three years during the transition years, but from there saw the, the, the massive Russian gas network which supplies Europe and all the countries of Europe, which today rely across their borders as their own domestic production has collapsed to about 25% in terms of their energy security on imported gas from, from Russia. Uh, the rest comes from uh, LNG or from pipelines from, from North Africa or from, from, from Norway or, or from the North Sea. It, it also, Russia also taught me, uh, because these were the transition years as part of the team that took Shell back into Russia, taught me how difficult it was for a country that, that saw the energy in its, uh, as, being, as being owned by the motherland and was... was took uh, to great difficulty in entrusting that to a foreign company for its development, either to bring finance or to bring, to bring uh, technology or to bring just managerial expertise to, to do that. Then spent some time on, in just north of Japan on an island, there's a large island called Sakhalin. It was part of the team that developed that. Uh, uh, and it was, uh, it's a three-day sail away from, from uh, Korea and from Japan and we developed Sakhalin Energy, 
which means that Russian gas for the first time flowed by sea to, uh, to Japan and Korea to now heat, heat uh, houses, to cook dinners in, in Japanese restaurants in Tokyo to, to run the, the Japanese uh, uh, power industry. Uh, and, and, and also the, the Korean one fr through, through co-gas. After that, spent five years in, uh, in Australia on Gorg the Gorgon LNG project, which is a joint venture between uh, Shell, Chevron, and, and uh, Exxon. And uh, today, that project supplies, the, uh, in, in, in no particular order, the, uh, the energy industries of, of China and, and Japan and India, uh, so that they and th that they can power their in in industry and make make their industry competitive because those countries are all in economic co competition against each other. And then most recently, spent six years as the chief executive of uh, Energy Canada, the largest foreign direct investment ever in Canadian history of at 50 billion US dollars, uh, to develop a a project called Energy Canada. And what you can see on screen is on your on your far right a, a gas formation called the Montney. Uh, which is shale gas, uh, which needs to be hydraulically fractured, is done so three kilometers below the surface. And then, then uh, the molecule flows along this pipeline, which, uh, which comes through two mountain ranges to a place called Kirimat, where the, the Red Star is. Um, that, uh, that journey takes about three days for, for a molecule, flows to the territory of 25 First Nations. We held 15,000 meetings with those First Nations. Um, and travel 660 kilometers through through those uh, through through the pipeline, and then it's an eight-day journey. But in uh, in 2023, that project will start supplying and, and power up the uh, the energy industries of also China and Japan and Korea. And then uh, I was also involved in running the Shell fleet of energy tankers. Uh, there are about 400 of these big LNG tankers, they're the largest, they're the size of an, an, of an aircraft carrier, the, the big ones, 300, 300 meters long. Um, they sail at uh, 40 kilometers per hour. And uh, you can see the, the many paths on the left-hand side of where these ships travel, Shell has a stake in, in one quarter of the, of the world's energy tankers. But that gave me an, an indication of, uh, of uh, or taught me that there have countries that, uh, that have surplus energy and today, uh, Qatar and the United States and Canada and Australia, Mozambique soon, uh, are, are the big have countries and they supply for a whole host of reasons. They have not countries which, and most of it, 50% of that f flows into the, the circle of, of China, Korea and Japan, as you can see through those he heavy arrows uh, on, on the right hand side of your screen. And last but not least, uh, an insight that I, that I have in my head is just the importance of how CO2 is treated and how important that has become. The Gorgon project, uh, we built the world's largest CO2 <coughs> sequestration scheme. Uh, it will sequester 4 million tons of CO2 per year. That on a global scale in terms of the CO2 releases is still small, but 4 million tons of CO2 sequestered per year for anybody who's worked in that space is quite significant. And on the right-hand side, uh, LNG Canada that we built um, the, the, the tons per c of CO2 per, uh, produced per ton of energy produced is the lowest ever in the world at 0 0.14. It's usually about 0 0.3. Uh, and that was as a result of just good technology choices and using the cold of northern Canada, uh, plus using hydropower to drive uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, instead of, of generating own electricity in the site. But that's, that's where the world debate is at now in terms of, of CO2 as a driver of, uh, of decisions. Now, if I then look back and say, so what does it, and come bring, bring that to South Africa, what does, what does it take to establish a gas industry in a country? The first one is, well, you'd establish a gas industry in a country if you have a shortage of domestic coal, oil, or uranium, and Japan and Korea as two countries did that. You do it if you have adequate domestic gas. And three countries that did that, did that that I've worked with is, is Russia, the United Kingdom, and, and Netherlands. And the Netherlands did not do so, so primarily for, for power generation. They did that to have low-cost heat available t for their massive greenhouses that, that produce flowers and, and vegetables that they, they export as, one, as their key export project. Or 
you establish a, 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 a gas industry if, you're, if there's concern for either the particulates or the socks or the emissions from coal when available, or high CO2 emissions of coal-fired power generation, which, and that's a key number that everybody who leaves today has to walk away with, every kilowatt hour of electricity generated from coal uh, conventionally uh, produces twice as much as a kilowatt hour produced from gas in a, in a combined cycle plant. And, and that's what is driving China and Japan and Korea to switch from, from coal to, uh, to, to gas. You, you develop a domestic gas industry when the country is very cold. And Russia has 20 of the 25 coldest cities in the world, so the whole country is, is heated uh, dur during the whole winter by, by gas. You develop a domestic gas industry if you've got a nearby country like Russia that, uh, that can bring surplus gas across the border into all the European countries or a country like Mozambique and its relationship with, with South Africa. And yes, you develop, if you develop an international industry, uh, a gas industry, if you're going to base that on imports based on paying, there is one international price really, and it's converging, converging in the world, and one needs to say, can I import on that basis, and is my economy strong enough? And last but not least, slightly tongue in the cheek, but there's this Asian tradition of cooking on gas, and <coughs> that still fuels a lot of, of, of Asian gas imports. Sorry, and one more. In Australia, as an example, the government has said before we become an, L an LNG exporting nation, what we need is also domestic gas industry, so you have to apportion a portion of your gas to domestic consumption, the same that Mozambique is, 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 is doing. There are two international bodies, and they are quite clear about their, that, that speak about the future of gas in the world. The first one is the International Energy Agency that says just gas demand is set to grow. The, the combination of reasons why gas industries grow just show, uh, positions it, it well. The second one is that Asia is key to that demand growth driven by China's push for gas to clean up its city. If you've been going to Beijing, I've been going to Beijing for about 30 years. If you, if you go to Beijing these days, you can fly in in the winter. And you, you, we used to have 10 meters of sight days today in winter when I was there last at the beginning of the year. It was blue skies as a result of conversion of coal to gas. The IEA says the, uh, the USA in that shale gas revolution of the United States leads global growth in natural gas supply export, and it's just amazing what has happened in, in Texas and what has happened in Louisiana as one after the other new LNG planters came, came on stream now, vying with Australia and Qatar to, to be the world's largest exporter. Um, at global gas trade, the only way that you, the, the mega pipelines are not really built anymore, to be frank. It is largely now driven by, by, by sea transportation. And LNG investment is needed. 2016 and 17 were quiet years. 2018 was the, the uh, FID that we took in Canada. And, and now the others are, are, are rolling next. Uh. And also, perhaps last, and this is, comes back to the pricing question that, that Sandra raised, um, there's increasingly a global energy price in dollars per mega BTU, uh, plus your transportation differentials uh, that, 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 that is emerging. And the massive differences between the US uh, and at Henry Hub and, and, uh, and Tokyo Bay oil-based prices for, for Asia and uh, balancing point prices in, in Asia is, is, uh, in Europe is, is disappearing. And the International Gas Union says cost competitiveness Security of supply and sustainability drives th that, that global expansion. So, standing before you this morning, uh, I've said to myself, when I now stare at the South African electricity industry and the South African energy industry, what are the dominant things that I see as we today discuss and, and ponder a future uh, energy industry for South Africa? And the first one, I have to say, and that's also I, I note that Kali Himan speaks last today, not first today, is that customers do not feature first on the stakeholder list of the energy industry. It is constantly other sets of stakeholders. And I, I hope that we can, as, as South Africa continues to transform, see customers and paying customers coming back as, and their interests as having to be served and as, uh, f f first on the list. The second one is a fact that everybody in this room knows, but f it is still clear to me 
even when I look at it from, from outside of the country, coal is based the base of Eskom and Sassol, and that major CO2 and sulfur emissions that, that come with that stands out compared to the, I've in my life visited 95 capital cities of the world, and what, what stands out to me again is, is still the air quality in, 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 in this part of the world where we are uh, meeting today com compared to so many other places. Once China is cleaning up its act, uh, uh, India, India will, will follow next, and, and South Africa needs to do so too. New capacity is needed to replace the aging 38-year-old fleet of, on average of, of Eskom. The neighbor next door, I am quite clear from my perspective, because I've seen it from through, through to a degree in I eyes uh, and the Darko eyes, but also uh, uh, ExxonMobil eyes and Shell eyes. I am quite sure 30 million tons plus from energy will be developed. Uh, I, I'll be surprised, just I know how long it takes to develop an energy project between FID and, and the first cargo. I'll be surprised if cargoes are available. I'm not talking about the coral floater uh, before 2025. Very interesting, and I've, I've stood in front of audiences in many places, is, is that there's interfuel competition and choice to a limited degree in South Africa, um, but there's no competition or choice in electricity. Uh, you get your, so your, you're assigned your supplier and you are planned for who produces that. We've seen four rounds of, renew of, of re renewable PPAs for IPPs in the country, but despite <coughs> a decade of talk, no uh, LNG cargo has been landed. And the central question is why not? And I'll, I'll answer that from my perspective in a moment. The Sanae study said there are significant risks to the energy industry in this country and they need, to, they need to be addressed and that leads from my conversations with a number of industrialists uh, to significant investment uncertainty. Um, when one thinks about imported gas and LNG, one needs to bear in mind as every other country do, and there are 40 countries that import LNG, 20 that export that LNG, but every country thinks about its balance of payments and its energy balance. Uh, in, in the process, and last but not least, and it's probably my, my single biggest concern about the ability to take decisions and execute them, is that central planning of the electricity industry leads to slow decision making and shortages, and we will need to address that at some stage. So <coughs> there are more qualified speakers in the form of John and, and Kali to speak and, and Sandra uh, about some of what happens in the country, but I say to myself, if we speak about a viable South African gas industry, um, how will we recognize it when we see it? And I say four things. The first one is that customers have choice of gas as an energy driver. When they wish to do so, it's available. They don't have to wait for a decade for planning permission or some regulatory approval. It's available and they can do so. That's, that's the norm in the world. Next, next one is that the gas market share, which is infinitesimally small today in, in the country, uh, one, has, one says I have a significant gas industry when about 10 to 25% of the energy in the country comes from gas. Third one is when gas is sourced from a combination of domestic or regional or international energy sources, and uh, we're all aware of what those options are. Uh, and the last one is when the when the map of South Africa is not as sparse as it is today in terms of the gas network of, of pipelines, um, it, uh, it, it dominates the northeastern part of the country uh, and where, where all the major cities and industrial centers are reached by that network. That's how a gas industry looks in a country with a viable gas industry. <coughs> so I close, Chris, with uh, four questions that is on my mind. Uh, to, to us as an audience, uh, to our planners, to the government, and the four questions that I think are central to the discussion today. Firstly is, can the economic competitiveness and the environmental impact of the South African economy be improved, and can energy supply risk be improved or reduced by the establishment of a gas industry? I'll do better than just ask the questions, I'll answer them, but I'll first tell you what the four questions are. The second question is, <coughs> if a gas industry is to be established, should it be on imported or domestic gas? The third question is, should coal 
or nuclear or solar or wind or gas power the next tranche of South African power plants. And I'm quite sure that's foremost on Sandra's mind as well as she sits uh, in the audience today. Uh, and, the, and at least two ministers' minds. And last, should a deregulated market or continued central planning decide the answers to these questions? So as a contributor today uh, and, uh, and, and speaker to you as, a, as an intelligent audience, I think I have to hang my hat somewhere. So my answer to the first question is, yes, the, uh, gas can contribute to South African competitiveness and energy security. Secondly, yes, I think the market should decide if a gas industry is to be established, whether it is imported or domestic gas. It shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a, a big national debate by the cabinet. That's not how it happens in countries. D develop the options, let, let players develop it and see what naturally develops, just get out of the way to do so. What should power the next tranches of, of South African power plants? My view, and it's a considered view, solar, gas, and wind. And last but not least, but that one you could predict me by now, rather than central planning, the market should really drive to answer all these questions. 